That's Psalm 78 that we read, that Thomas read. It gave a lot of description of God. It gave a lot of uh, information of who God is and what God could do as, as we looked at that. We found that the God's greatness is described in His omniscience, all-knowing, His omnipotence being all-powerful, and His omnipresence being everywhere at one time. We found all that in that psalm. We found the fire. We found the cloud. We found the power uh, to, to do miracles, to bring water from the rock, to cause manna to come from, come from heaven. And then, of course, we found that God is all-knowing. He knows everything. We find that yet people... Knowing all this about God, everybody in here knows all that about God, and we know what God can do. Is there any question in here from anybody this morning that wonders what God can do? Are we pretty well set on the greatness and magnificence of God? I found that last Monday during these, these uh, uh, solar eclipse, everybody's eyes were gazed upward. I wonder if we keep our eyes gazed upward as Christians looking for the return of Jesus. Can you imagine with everybody looking up, waiting for Jesus to come back? But most of us Christians don't even worry about that. And, and that's okay. I mean, that, you know, we're not supposed to worry about it, but we are supposed to keep our eyes on the eastern sky for our redemption draweth nigh. And we are supposed to say, Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come quickly, Lord Jesus. That is to be the cry of our heart. So Jesus, God, knows everything, and the heavens declare His glory. We find this in Psalm 78. But I want to focus on verses 40 and 41. How often they provoked Him in the wilderness and grieved Him in the desert. Yet again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Can I tell you today that we do things in our own life that limits God? working in our lives. Notice that the scripture in the New Testament says that, that the, the, uh, He is able to do ab- exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power of God that works in us. How much of God's power are you allowing to work in you today? How much are you allowing the Holy Spirit to flow through you or have you thrown up roadblocks and saying, I will only go so far in allowing God to touch my life. There's only so much I'm going to allow God to have. There's only so much I'm going to allow God to do. There's only so much that my mind can comprehend. And so I'm not going to allow God to get into this part of my life. I will allow Him in this part, but I've got roadblocks up. I've got chains on that these young people are singing about. I've got those things on and they are limiting Many times the reason we're being limited to what God can do in our lives, it's not God, it's us. It's us. God God is waiting on us. They tempted God. And the Bible says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, we could go into a, 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 a diatribe or we could go into some kind of explanation here this morning about all that entails of tempting God. But did you know also that God doesn't tempt you? God does not tempt you. Satan tempts you with sin. A sickness that you may have is not a temptation from God. Sickness comes from the devil. Why would God take something the devil has and throw it on you to tempt you to see if you're faithful? That's not what that's all about. And that's a, that's a song, uh, uh, a message for another time. But we find here that yet the people limited or what they did, they set boundaries from which God could work. They set boundaries from which God could work. Now that can include a lot of things. They set boundaries. How many of you have set boundaries... And said, God, can, you you got to work in this manner. You can only work on Sunday morning when I'm at church worshiping. You can only work when I'm praying. You can only work when I've got the right attitude for you to work. You can only work when I feel goosebumps on my body. You can only work when I got chill bumps, you know, from the Holy Spirit. Now, I'll tell you what, that's an awesome thing because I walked in the prayer room this morning 
And you could have hung a hat on the goosebumps that come up on me when I walked in that prayer room because I'm telling you the Holy Ghost was in that place. I said, let's just have church in here and let them sing out there. Let's just bring everybody in there and have church. It was powerful. But is that the only way God can work? Is that Have you limited Him to those times? Or maybe you've limited Him by how it's supposed to look. Maybe you've said, well, you know, it can't be God if it looks this way. Now, I know Friday night we had a prophetic meeting, and I want to tell you something. God was here. There may have been some people who didn't think He was. But you know how I know He was here? Because the Word of God says, where two or three gather together in my name, I am in their midst. And He was here. And He gave some very good words to, to many people that were here. You say, well, I found two or three things I didn't agree with. Well, we probably could find two or three things we don't agree with you either. I'm not trying to be smart. I'm just telling you that, you know, you're not going to always agree with everything that somebody says. Okay? So there are boundaries. And when, when, you're, when you're sitting there critiquing every word that a preacher says, you have set boundaries around yourself that says, I cannot listen because I've got to hear, it's got to be everything just exactly right. Well, if you've set boundaries already this morning around the Word of God that's going to be preached, you're not going to hear anything. Amen. You may as well have stayed home. By the way, y'all, this morning with Children's Church, both Children's Churches and everything, we have 103 here today. And we still got empty seats, so y'all get your friends on down here. We can, we can we get them on down here. Amen. They got 23 in Children's Church, and they got seven or eight in the fourth, uh, the uh, four-year-old children's church. So about 30 kids here today. Is that not amazing? Is that not awesome? Plus these teenagers, great job, teenagers. Give me a fist pump. Come on. Hoo, 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 hoo. Yeah, you did a good job. Amen. Brett and Amanda's doing an awesome job with the teens. Change and limit God. So God can do all things, but we can limit God. Why isn't God doing what you have asked? Could it possibly be us? The first thing I want to look at is the, the number one thing that limits God, and this is very unpopular today, the chain of sin limits God. Now, we have a lot of teaching, and I'm not going to go into all that, but there's a lot of teaching you know, about grace, and thank God for God's grace, okay, and all of that. But, I, but sin still separates from God. Sin still separates from God. Now, we have grace to overcome that sin and receive forgiveness for that sin. But if you are continually in a state of sin, and then you also say, well, I'm a Christian, so God's okay with that, I'm telling you, you're limiting God's power in your life. So, would you rather go ahead and sin? Paul says, God forbid. Should, should I sin so that grace can abound that much more? And then how did Paul answer that? How did he answer it? I already told you once. He said, God forbid. Now I'm going to ask you again. So should I sin so that grace can abound that much more? God forbid. Why would Paul say God forbid? Because sin separates and sin limits God. When a, when a church has sin in the camp, it limits the power of God in the whole bunch. Y'all listening, teenagers? Sin will limit the power of God in your life. God will forgive you for that sin. But if you continue in sin, continue in sin, continue in sin, you are limiting how God can operate in your life. So we've got to let go of that chain. God hates sin. I haven't found anywhere in the Bible where He changed His mind about that. Have you? Can anybody tell me where God changed His mind that He no longer hated sin? Good, I'll let you stay. <laughs> Willfully yielding ourselves to sin will limit God. God cannot minister fully to us as long as we resist 
the Holy Spirit in dealing with our sin problem. You see, when you continue in sin, I promise you the Holy Spirit is trying to deal with that sin, but what you're doing, how long will you resist the Holy Ghost? How long will you resist the Holy Spirit in dealing with the sin in your life? Resisting the Holy Ghost becomes a very serious matter in a person's life. That's also called grieving the Holy Spirit. And so we find that many of the apostles, even Stephen, and he got stoned for it. How long will you resist the Holy Spirit? How long will you resist the Holy One of Israel? How long will you limit God? How long will you continue in your sin problem without, without allowing the Holy Spirit to come in and as He tries to guide you into a better way of living? And you say, uh-uh. Grace tells me I can live how I want to and that's exactly what I'm going to do and it's nobody else's business. And the Holy Spirit says, okay. I'll just kind of withdraw a little bit and let's see how you like it. I'll pull back a little bit. Let's see how you like it when you don't feel any goosebumps. How long has it been since you walked in church and everybody's talking about, man, God was there. The Holy Spirit was awesome. The power of God was so present. And you're there sitting there saying, man, I didn't feel nothing. You not, might need to check your barometer, your water pump, your radiator, or something. God cannot minister fully. Our response, we need to repent. Plain and simple. If there's sin in your life, you need to repent. I thought I'd get a resounding amen. I got two. I'm going to say it again and see if I can get a few more. If you got sin in your life, you need to repent. There you go. That's more like a Pentecostal bunch. If we've got sin in our life, we need to repent. That's the first response that needs to come to mind. Confess your sin. Okay? Confess your sin. And God is, is able and just and will provide re, uh, re, uh, forgiveness for your sin. Your flesh will act upon what you think. Oh, excuse me. Went to the wrong one. We need to open a portal in our lives to heaven by communicating with God through the Holy Spirit. So, now how do we communicate with God? Through the Holy Spirit, right? We communicate with God through the Holy Spirit. So if you're resisting the Holy Spirit, what does that do to your communication with God? It cuts it off, doesn't it? I, you don't know how many times I've heard people say, Oh, my prayers, I feel like they're hitting the ceiling and bouncing back. Well, first of all, they're not doing that. They're actually going on through. But what is happening is you are feeling a lack of communication with God because you can't hear anything back. And many times, I'm not going to say this is always the case, but many times the reason you can't hear anything back from God is because you have cut off communication with the Holy Spirit through resisting Him and dealing with the the discrepancies in your life. That's why Paul talked about grace can be voided or in vain. Have you cut off communication with the Holy Spirit by resisting Him? Could it be that maybe you're not hearing from God because you've resisted the Holy Spirit? I've got good news for you today. All you got to do is open that portal back up through repentance and you'll begin hearing from God again. He'll talk to you. He'll sing to you. He'll dance over you. He might even give you a chill bump, Danny. No. <laughs> he might even give you a chill bump. We need, to, we need to come against Satan's plan to keep you away from God. Satan does not want you communicating with God. Because when, he, when, when you start communicating with God, Satan's plan gets revealed. His schemes come to light. And all of a sudden you begin to say, you know all this time, I've been thinking this was something and all, and all the time it's been the devil the whole time. So you've got to open your communication. So sin is a chain that will absolutely choke the Holy Spirit right out of you. 
You say, I don't believe that, preacher. I, I believe I, I'm a spirit and I was created as a spirit and God is a spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. And so my spirit is always going to, going to be lively and, and always going to be uh, 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 in tune with God. Not, not necessarily. The Bible says to, to, uh, to stir yourself up, to, to replenish yourself. It talks about that all the time, about replenishing ourselves and, and, and encouraging ourselves. If you've cut off communication with God through resisting the Holy Spirit, you're going to have a hard time encouraging yourself and you're going to walk around depressed and angry. You're going to walk around always upset. It's always this person's fault, that person's fault. It's never your fault. And pride and everything else comes along. And don't anybody point at anybody here right now. It ain't my fault, his fault, your fault, our fault. Nobody's fault, everybody's fault. All right, the second thing. Boy, this is really going to get, get, get you down in your toenails. A bad attitude will limit God. A bad attitude wraps chains around God's hand. Now, attitude mean, means a mental position or picture of someone or something. In other words, you've already got it set in your mind what it's going to be. You've got a picture of it. Every time a certain person comes to your mind, you've got a mental picture. <laughs> Bells and whistles start going off and all this kind of stuff. You know, oh, no, 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 and all this, you know, and, 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 and then the, the Lord, uh, not the Lord, but your memory takes you back to something bad maybe they did to you or something along that nature. And so every time you see them, rather than having a mental picture of them as forgiven and redeemed, your mind immediately goes back to what they did to you many years ago. And you're sitting there saying, well, I forgave them. Well, did you really? Forgiveness, I saw this from uh, Chris Valentin. Forgiveness rewrites your history. Did y'all hear that again? Forgiveness rewrites your history. Now, he gave an example of, of forgiveness. He said him and his wife were getting a spat. And she, she, uh, he, I'll just give you the example he used. He said he might have left his underwear laying on the floor, and his wife despises his underwear being laying around because she do not want to pick it up. All right? Ha, 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 we're not going to ask any questions here this morning, all right? So he, he'd go pick them up, and he said he went about six months. And one day he left. No, he'd, he'd done real good. He hadn't left any laying around. No, 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 no. They wasn't, they wasn't piled up, no. And so about six months of doing real good, and then he left the pair laying around, and his wife come to him and said, I'm tired of telling you, you always leave your underwear laying around, and I'm not picking them up. And he said, hold it. You forgave me, and so that other time six months ago doesn't even count. God doesn't even remember it, and you shouldn't either. So it starts over today. I'm going to pick them up, and you've got to forgive me. <laughs> he didn't say how it went. <laughs> Do you follow what I'm saying though? When we forgive somebody, it starts over. The slate is wiped clean. Aren't you glad that when God forgave you, He wiped the slate clean? Are you wiping the slate clean with those who have offended you once they've asked for forgiveness? If you haven't, you're binding the hands of God. Because He can't work through unforgiveness. Are we hitting the toenails yet? So a bad attitude. The Bible says we're to have the mind of Christ. Did you know your flesh will act upon what you think or say? Your flesh will act upon what you think and what you say. So if you think that person's bad, guess what your flesh is going to do? It's going to act upon it. If you think that you forgave them, but you don't know for sure, well, guess what? You didn't. You didn't. You see, your flesh responds to your mind, and if your mind isn't renewed in Christ, then your flesh is going to remind as flesh because your mind is working in the flesh. Because your mind works in the flesh, your spirit will respond to the flesh. Your, your, your body will remind of the flesh. Your, then your mouth will begin to speak out through the mind fleshly things instead of speaking in the spirit. I'm telling you, 
I, I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't know, but, I, but if you don't know that, you need to understand. That's why the, the Word of God is so powerful in our lives and why what we say and how we respond and what we do is so important. And so in, in teaching here this morning and sharing with you, uh, it's so important that we have the mind of Christ, that we understand that out of, out of our innermost being are the flow, the issues of life. And so if out of our mouth is flowing the issues of life, you're telling the whole world what's important to you through your mouth. Because it's flowing out of you. And this limits God from working in your life. Because all of a sudden your bad attitude, see a bad attitude doesn't just mean you're mad all the time. A bad attitude is, a, is when you have an attitude about yourself that's not right. Many of you have an attitude about yourself that is not holy. Because word curses have been spoken over you. Somebody down the line told you, you'll never amount to anything. You're no good. You might have been bullied in high school and kids said, oh, you're a nobody, you're a nothing, you're never going to do anything. And all these negative word curses, and this has formed an attitude in your own mind, in your own self, that says, I can't do anything. Why do you think Paul then wrote the scripture that said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So this attitude is not just being angry or mad all the time. It is an attitude about yourself. And then that, that when you don't like yourself and you don't love yourself, if you can't like or love yourself, you won't like or love other people. Because that mindset will filter out from you and everybody will detect it. Some examples. God is against me. God doesn't care. God is to blame. All of these are attitudes and words that will limit God. The attitude you come to church in determines just about what you're going to get in church that day. About 99% of the time, if you come to church with a bad attitude, you're going to leave with one. Well, I'm going to go because I have to, but I'm, no, I'm not I'm just going to hear the same old thing again. I'm going to hear this, I'm going to hear that, and they're going to sing. And they're, they're, but we, we fooled you today. The young people did a video. So you was wrong when you had the service all planned out in your mind before you ever got here. <laughs> so we find that the attitude, the mental, the mental state that you're in will determine what you're going to receive from God because you've already limited God with that. The Pharisee said, I'm sure glad I'm not like everybody else. How did he go away from that situation? Unjustified. Now you think about what being unjustified means. That's not just a word in the Bible. When it says you're unjustified, that means God says, no, I still remember your sin." When he went away unjustified, that meant he went away still guilty. And it's all because of his attitude of self-righteousness. He went away guilty. He had not been declared justified by God. Folks, until you're declared justified by God, you're still guilty. The publican said, here I am a sinner. And he went away justified. Oh God, I want to be justified. And I have been justified. Say, I am justified. I am declared not guilty. Lord, renew my mind. Give me the right attitude about myself. And that will give me the right attitude about others. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? 
we find that we must come into the house of God with love in our hearts for everyone. And again, this goes back to a mental mindset. Boy, Sunday morning. Sunday mornings. How many of y'all love Sunday mornings trying to get ready for church? How many of y'all, uh, how many of y'all the devil hid your socks today? <laughs> or the kids' socks. Yep. Or, or, or the husband didn't wake you up on time. Or the wife didn't wake you up on time. Or the alarm didn't wake you up on time. Yeah, there we go. There we go. All of these things, you know, the devil really gets to work on Sunday morning, you know, to keep us away from church. Uh, how many of y'all, I'm, I don't want you to raise your hand on this, how many of you uh, husbands and wives fought all the way to church and made up in the parking lot? You see, the devil brings coughs. How many of you, you know, if, if anybody's going to be sick in the family, they're going to be sick on Sunday morning. One of the kids is going to have a cough, a cold, a fever. Now, throwing up or whatever, but Monday morning they're fine unless they're in school and then they want to stay home a day. Hey, Elliot. <laughs> How are you? He's not sick today. No, in Jesus' name he's not sick today. Amen. But on Sunday morning, the devil works overtime to keep you out of church. And that's why you, church can never become a, ne a negotiating uh, uh, exercise. Because when you negotiate whether you're going to church, uh, really the one you're negotiating with is the devil. That's who you're negotiating with. Because he don't want you to be here. And so if you put any doubt, you speak it out. You know... Do we really want to go to church tomorrow? The devil says, aha, there's a little bit of doubt there. Let's see if we can make one of the kids sick. Let's see if we can get our stump our toe. Let's see if we can have them throw the cell phone through the plate glass window tonight being mad, and then they won't have an alarm in the morning. Let's see if we can do this. You see, because all of a sudden you have thrown it out there. Do we really want to go to church tomorrow? And the devil says, no, you don't. No, you don't. You know you don't. You know you don't. And he just keeps whispering over and over and over and over and over. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. Until finally you say, you know what? I believe we'll stay home in the morning. And get in trouble. You might, you might run into this washer and, and cut an artery in, in your ankle and bleed half to death, right? That's Dot told me that if she'd have been at church last Sunday night when she, well, she was supposed to be, she wouldn't have hurt her foot. <laughs> but so you, when you negotiate, you're actually negotiating with the devil because you're already putting seed out there. And do you not think he's going to pounce on that? Do you see how that limits God from working in your life because of your attitude and what you're speaking and what you're saying? Let me hurry on. Unbelief will certainly limit God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. A bad confession will lead or exemplify unbelief. When you have a bad confession, well, God doesn't love me. God will do this for Danny, but he would never do it for me. Well, your bad confession has already tied God's hands because you already stated God can't or won't do it for you. So you have said, well, God looks as... I can't do anything for them because they've already told me that they don't believe. Now, how many have been there before? I saw God do it for somebody, but He won't do it for me. You can't say things like that. You've got to begin to, to, to have the positive word come from your mouth, a word of faith, a word of belief, a word of understanding what God wants in your life. You know, uh, Gage, for instance... Been down to the hospital praying for Gage. Now this boy's been in the hospital for seven weeks. Today, they, they, they actually have him on a ventilator. And they say he's just getting weaker and weaker. And the doctors are telling Teresa that uh, he don't even know he's in the world. And she refuses to believe that. And when I saw him the other day and I went up and talked to him, he responded. So I believe he knew that I was there. And I, so I think doctors are going by what it's supposed to be in this situation and not what it actually is. Anyway, the last time they took him off the ventilator and put him on, on uh, a CPAP where he had access to oxygen but it wasn't being forced 
It, he, he, about three hours, four hours, he was able to, and then he crashed again, and they had to put him back on the ventilator. Well, they're going to take him off again today and put him on a CPAP. And the doctors have made indication that if he crashes again, that they don't think they should revive him. They, don't, they, shouldn't, put him on a, they shouldn't put him on a ventilator. But so we're going to believe that when he goes off that ventilator today that he's going to breathe on his own. Now, what would happen if I walked into that hospital room as a minister of faith and I looked at Teresa and I said, he's going to die. There ain't no hope for him. What if I'd have walked into Jeremy's uh, hospital room and said, there's no hope for Jeremy, he's going to die. But we just continued to pray and continued to believe. Even when it didn't look good, even when there was no promise or no hope, it, it, and everybody else was saying, the doctors, you know, give up, give up, give up, give up. Saints of God, we cannot give up. We cannot give up. We cannot give up. Don't let those words come out of your mouth. You've got to speak positively about your situation, and you've got to speak life into it. Don't have unbelief in your life. I can't is a word of unbelief. I can is the word of faith. I can't is a word of unbelief. I can is a word of faith. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He didn't say I can't do anything because God doesn't strengthen me. Chains that limit God. The last point... We tell God, we limit God by telling God what it's got to look like and how it has to be done. It's got to look like this. You know what? Things don't look like they did when I was growing up in church. Revivals don't look the same. They just don't. But you know what I found out? And this is the first reference to Cuba you've heard today. You know what I found out? that you didn't have to shake, rattle, and roll to see God's miracles come to, pl- come to pass. Didn't have to, Dan. Did not have to. All you had to do was walk up and, and confess Jesus Christ, and then they confessed Jesus Christ, and some of them got healed before they ever accepted Jesus. But guess what they did? They accepted Jesus in the end. There wasn't any shaking, rattling, rolling. I didn't even hear anybody speak in tongues. And I'm not, I'm not uh, saying that's not necessary because I believe, I believe wholeheartedly in speaking in tongues and being baptized in the Holy Ghost because that opens up that portable. Elvis Presley was made famous, or one of the most famous songs that, that, that he sang was he would always end his concert with what song? What? My way. I did it my way. I did it my way. I did it my way. I got to ask you, Has God got to do it your way? Has He got to do it the way you think it ought to look like? The way it ought to be done? Or have you taken those chains off and said, God, you can do it however you please. You just move however you want to. You show up however you want to show up. If you show up in worship, if you show up in preaching, if you show up in Sunday school, it's good to have you in all of those places for sure. But God, however you want to I'm not going to tell you what it's got to look like I don't know because I'm not the Holy Ghost he lives in me but I'm not him when we begin to dictate to God how the miracle has got to look we limit him and he says that wasn't the way I was going to do it so just forget it that's not how I'm doing that God wants to grow RCF and we have in our mind what we want to do, and, and we feel like God's told us to build a building, and so on and so forth, and, and we're doing it the way we think God wants us to do it, and so far that's worked out pretty good. Thought I'd get at least one amen there. <laughs> so far that's worked out pretty good. Who knows that God may, may have another way down the road? I don't know. But you see, we can't always do it our way. We've got to... Do it His way. If it's got to be in our time, how many of y'all have set time limits on God? Time limits are off limits. 
because God does not work in our time. You want me to tell you what setting a time limit, does, the time limit on God does? First of all, how many of you know what it means to impeach? That means to remove from authority, right? Okay, to remove from authority. When you set a time limit on God, you impeach His authority. You impeach Him. You impeach His authority. You, move, you remove Him out of the factor because you have tied His hands. So in our time, impeaches His wisdom and shows our own pride. When you impeach the wisdom of God, what you're doing then, not only you're removing His authority, but you are showing your own pride that you know more than He does. And if it doesn't happen in this time, because I know more. Do you? Do we know more than God? So if you've set a time limit on God, You've impeached his wisdom and you've declared that you're smarter than he is. Will that limit God? That will limit God, won't it? God will do it his way in his time. God will do it his way in his time. And that's what's best for us. So I want you to say this with me. God will do it His way. God will do it His way. In His time. In His time. And that's what's best for me. That's what's best for me. Believe it. Amen. 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 How many of y'all ready to break some chains? Any of those hit home this morning? All right. Here's what we're going to do. Let's bow our heads. I'm going to move this back. You say, boy, you ended that quick. Father, I ask you right now in Jesus' name, I pray that the Holy Spirit will absolutely minister here this morning just as you've already done. And we open our, open our minds and our hearts to hear from the Holy Spirit right now. And God, I pray that you will help us to now take inventory of any chains that we may have that are limiting the Holy One of Israel, that are limiting how you could work in our lives. So I ask you in the name of Jesus just to be in this place, at this time, to bring what you need to bring to each and every individual in this building right now. Every single person. I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will turn on that searchlight. Lord, we're not looking for sin. If sin's there, then the Holy Spirit will reveal it. But we're just looking for things in our own lives. Weights. Weights that beset us weights that drag us down weights that limit you chains that we're carrying around as a bondage now Holy Spirit do your thing